supply start talking? Uh, yeah, it, it, it always takes a couple seconds to connect and then it's like, it'll get me right in the middle of, ah, uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Boy, right they missed it. <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, oh, you wanna do your intro? Nope, let's skip it. Okay, well, this is I'm Miriam. Miriam. This is Chris. I'm Chris. Um, we made Keto Chow. But tonight we are here to talk about Dr. Peter Ballersted. The sod father. <laughs> He's Don like, we're going to Pedro. <laughs> we're going to talk about him. Yes. Yes. We're going to talk about him in front of his face. Okay. So remotely. what's that? You remotely, right? So yeah, that's remotely. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's been a while since, since we've been able to sit down and you guys eat steaks and me sit there and not eat yeah, a steak. I, yeah. That's a great, that's a fond memory, isn't it, Miriam? <laughs> yeah. It's it certainly delicious. smelled good. <laughs> Was good. Was good. I, I, I bet. So um, for any of you who are joining in that don't know Dr. Peter Ballersted, um, Peter, can, can you introduce yourself? Tell us, kind of give us the... 411. Yeah, the 411. Yeah, the 411. Well, I actually have just a real brief little sort of introduction oh, that's, that's to who right. and what I'm about okay. uh, on one of these. So let me go there okay. um, uh, using the technology, which did yeah. work at one point. Why is it not letting me share screen? It's not letting me share screen. So you just got the thing down in the bottom? Yep, clicking on it repeatedly. Hmm. Um, let's see. Here, I'll make you big. Nope. Make you really big. That didn't do anything for me. It um, sure didn't. In, in terms of giving me um, the ability Power. to share. So I don't know what's going on. Um, let's see. Hold on just a second. Try it again. Because now Chris isn't sharing his screen. Yes. Well, I, I always have something queued up just in case. Okay. There's there's no response when I click on it other than when the cursor goes over it, it changes. It then says share screen. I click my left mouse button and nothing happens. Oh, man. So okay. Is there any way you can email it to me really quick? <laughs> um, well, sure. I can try doing that. Um, bear with us, folks, and forgive me because I frequently talk when I try to do things. That's right. I also do that. Too. So now um, we first met. Actually, I'll I'll tell everybody how I introduced my father to Dr. Peter Ballerstein. Oh, nice. <laughs> so my dad and I were driving down to um, we were driving down to a river trip down the Grand Canyon. We were on our way to Las Vegas, and on our way there, I had just heard a podcast from the two keto dudes that was talking about this guy named Dr. Peter Ballersted, and it took me the better part of, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe two years, to figure out how to properly type Spell your name. Ballersted. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got it right now. Yes, you um, got it. So um, oh, people say he's so soft spoken. No, it's that I'm loud spoken. Um, mm. But or maybe I'm too far away from the microphone. That could be it. Um, okay. I I always put the microphone closer to Miriam because I I'm, so I'm overbearing. Spoken. But so on our way from Salt Lake City to Las Vegas, one of the things that my dad and I listened to was this podcast from Dr. Peter Ballerstead talking about the sustainability of, of animals and how ruminants, particularly cows and, and whatnot, they don't just, it, it, they're not detrimental to the environment. Rather, they actually build soil, they sequester carbon into healthy soil. Um, they, there's a real interplay between these animals that are designed for the rangeland and without them, rangeland simply don't exist. And you hear so many people talking about how, well, if you want to save the environment, don't eat beef because beef is so terrible for the environment. And 
my dad was he he thought it was really cool. Then about a week later, as my children and I and Miriam were driving to a, a little town in the middle of Utah, and we keep passing all these cows on the side of the road. <laughs> and in Utah, the majority of the state does is not arable land. You cannot grow anything in most of Utah except for cows and sheep. And that's it. It just doesn't work for anything else. And so I actually played that same podcast again for my kids. <laughs> it was really a lot of fun. Good. You're so. Quality parenting. I Father of the year award, <laughs> I, I have to say. Um, I'm known for having very chunky, you should pardon the expression, beefy uh, PowerPoint Beefy. files. Um, <laughs> the one that I was going to send you is 21 meg, which ain't going to happen. Um, okay. So okay. let me just kind of talk to it. So I've okay. got it up on the screen now and I don't see what's behind. Um, so I'll try not to look too awkward. Um, okay. <laughs> for people who don't know who I am, I'm an advocate for, and it's it's fair for you to know the perspective I'm coming from. So I'm a I'm an advocate for therapeutic carbohydrate reduction and ruminant animal agriculture. That's my perspective on things. I've worked in forage agriculture for most of my adult life. I currently work for a forage seed company, but this, this advocacy work I learn my own time. There may be the occasional ag audience that the the company is willing to pay me to or in some way subsidize my appearance but that's not the case tonight um <laughs> unfortunately there's not a real high cost either so no nope. um so we're going to define some terms agronomy is the science and technology of producing and using plants and agriculture for food fuel fiber and land restoration okay um, it has come to encompass areas of plant genetics, plant physiology, meteorology, and soil science. Now, I'm trained as a forage agronomist. So forage is that plant material that's eaten by grazing livestock. And historically, that was going to be pasture, right? Stuff that was directly grazed by animals, but it's come to encompass things like hay and silage as well and it can be more than just pasture it could be crop residues like grazing corn stalks or a small grain crop it can be um, immature cereal crops so in the southern plains a lot of wheat pasture gets grazed early in the season um, so that's forage so forage agronomy then and ruminants are even toed hooved mammals they okay. chew a cud right so things like cattle sheep antelope deer giraffes relatives right so that's sort of that background um a are, are your camels ruminants i don't believe so i believe okay. camels are actually i think the term is a pseudo ruminant but i could oh, okay. be wrong on that um they're probably not, they're probably a distant relation. Um, okay, just wondering. Anyway. <laughs> so that's my professional background. I'm, I'm trained as a forage agronomist, as a ruminant nutritionist. Um, but like many of us, I had my own personal health journey uh, starting in 2007. In 2007, I was a 51-year-old balding, obese, pre-diabetic. And today I'm just balding. Um, and, that joke never gets old, man. <laughs> yeah. So I I started with um, I started uh, with uh, protein power, essentially. Mikey, Mike, and Mary Dan Eads's book, and largely I've been following that sort of diet, plus or minus, since that time. Um, lately, I've become more and more animal source food based and less and less plant source food in my diet. And I seem to do better that way. Um, but starting in 2010, I started showing up at various conferences and I jokingly say I've been stalking some of the people that appear 
Um, I'm looking at one picture now from, I think it was Breckenridge, you know, and I'm in this picture with people like Eric Westman, Jason Fung, Zoe Harkum, Nina Teichholz, um, Jeff Gerber, Mark Kukazella, uh, Marianne DeMasi, um, Gary Fetke, Jimmy Moore, uh, Andreas Einfeld, there's Mike Eads, there's Dave Feldman. So, um, you know, the caption I put on this is what's a forage agronomist and what are you doing here? <laughs> um, but I, I kind of discovered this niche where I stand between the agricultural tribe that I'm trained to serve and have worked with for, um, a couple decades now. And, then the, we'll call it metabolic health, you know, species appropriate diet, nutrition uh, community. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that I can foster conversation between all the different silos of information that exist. So starting 10 years ago, I started writing and talking about something that I called grass-based health, which is Again, as you were mentioning, the idea that healthy soils and healthy plants and healthy animals are all interrelated. And then, of course, we can tie in that piece of healthy people and we can have all of this thanks to ruminant animal agriculture. Along the way, I've developed some maybe controversial statements and maybe purposely <laughs> so. Um, one is saying that the preponderance of high quality evidence from all scientific disciplines strongly suggests that the most likely harm associated with animal source food consumption is from not consuming enough. Okay. That, that could be controversial. It, it's it, very it, well stated though. <laughs> In, in some audiences, yes, and maybe then that opens up because we're talking about high quality evidence. We're not talking about the kind of evidence that we get from nutritional epidemiology of chronic disease, and that could open up a conversation. Um, but the fact remains that there are the, there is objective evidence of people in the world today suffering from too little animal source food in their diet. It's high quality evidence. There are people doing great intervention work showing how little it can take to make a dramatic difference. Um, the statistics are something like a quarter of children under five globally are stunted due to a lack of essential nutrition. And that has been tied to a lack of animal source food in their diet. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a third of women of childbearing age globally are anemic, right? So, and, and there are others, and we'll get into some of those things, but I, I don't think a lot of people understand that, especially from the high income countries. So learning about what the reality is on the ground in the low and middle income countries might help us with the overall conversation. Um, a statement that was used, um, I, I made a cameo appearance in um, a movie that's just um, being made available. It was, and now I guess you can see it again for free if you belong to dietdoctor.com, but it's Sacred Cow. Oh, okay. Um, and my quote was, we have no hope of feeding today's world, let alone the world of 2050 without ruminant animal agriculture is a fundamental part of whatever agricultural systems are practiced in whatever part of the world they're being practiced. And as you mentioned earlier, yes, there's another narrative, but let's just put it on the table and have a conversation. Yeah. And again, I, I, I think the great message that I hope I can help more people understand is that we can have healthy people and healthy soils thanks to ruminant animal agriculture. So that's sort of my introduction. I've got another one that I've just put together that deals more on the environmental aspects. Okay. Um, and so it's really a shame that we can't share it because it's, you know, obviously <sighs> high quality graphics. I made them. Um, <laughs> But um, so I don't know if there are 
um, questions that we want to hit now, or you, I just want to go into that bit. Well, okay. So someone brought up the, uh, the, the, the topic of cow farts, right? That's, That'll that's always, that. That, that's always a fun one. Um, so I, I'm assuming you're going to address that, but one thing that, one of the things that I really want to get into is something that you touched on in an interview that you did with Dr. Brett Schur. And at the beginning of that interview, um, he came into it w talking about the virtues of grass-fed, grass-finished beef. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that a lot of people... It's, it's something that a lot of people um, look towards that you have to have grass-fed beef, you have to have grass-finished beef. The beef isn't good unless it's, it's, it's that... And all other beef is inferior. And you presented really well a different outlook on the whole grass fed. And something that that's I've, I've seen come up multiple times since then is when people talk about grain fed beef, they actually don't know what they're talking about. They think, I don't know, that the, the cows have a bunch of like, corn cobs and they're sitting there going back and forth? Well, I, I don't know. I, I, it, it is a memory that's burned into my mind um, or an image burned into my memory of at the end of one presentation, Danny Vega came charging down the center aisle and I was like <laughs> checking out left and right to make sure that he stopped at the microphone. Um, yeah. And he did. And I was relieved and uh, he's a sweet guy, but um he said he his question, uh, as best as I can remember, is now you're telling me that a cow doesn't spend its entire life in a cage. OK, now, first of all, feedlots are pens. They're not cages, right? They're 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 large areas that animals have room to move around. They design them so that there's a certain amount of bunk space for each animal. Right. They they, they got this down. There's some rules that they follow. OK, but. Number two is for even for a commercial steer, you know, just the kind of beef that you buy at Safeway, that or Kroger, or whatever. What's what's a chain store in Salt Lake? Uh, Kroger is Smith's. We've also got Walmart, just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So so that animal is going to spend the vast majority of its life on pasture, either nursing from mama while she grazes or grazing itself. So, you know, generally these animals are weaned somewhere around five, six months. Mm -hmm. Generally, they're going to only spend the last four or five months in a concentrated feeding operation. Um, and they're probably going to be harvested somewhere around 22 months. Okay. Now that's so, a lot of that is economics, right? Of course. Because feeding it's also environmental. Pastures, yeah. But, but you don't feed a cow the entire time at a feedlot because it's, it's too expensive. Well, so, things, right? well, right. Uh, mama cow is very good at taking relatively low quality forage and supporting herself because after she gets to be about two or three years, she's mature size. So it's maintenance or it's supporting the pregnancy and then lactation, right? Yeah. So as you approach the end of pregnancy and then into lactation, her feed needs are highest. And then once you dry her off, once you wean the calf and she dries off, then they're close to their lowest. And so one of the manager's jobs is to make sure that they're well aligning the nutritional requirements of their animal with the resources that that farmer ranch offers, right? Because it turns out feed is like 80% of the cost of a cow-calf operation. So you, you, you want to minimize the amount of stored feed you buy or put up and then feed. Um, and there are tricks to do that. And that's where forage agronomy comes in and grazing management, some other things. So no, mama cow is so the majority, uh, you know, in order to have a calf to sell, 
you need a mama cow and you need a bull somewhere. Yeah. Um, either a herd bull who actually, you know, natural cover or you use artificial ins insemination. So there had to be a bull someplace. So you've got yeah. bulls, you've got calves, uh, cows that don't go to the feedlot. And then you've got young females, some of which are going to be replacement females. They don't go to the feedlot. So now you're talking about a relatively small number of animals out of the whole beef herd that end up going into a feedlot if they do. And even when they go there, then it's a portion of what they eat is grain. They're still getting forage. And if you take a step back and look global, well, first of all, if you look at a typical commercial corn fed steer, that's air quotes for people listening, um, <laughs> those animals are still getting something around 90% of what they consume throughout their life is not human edible. And that's an important, important point is that cows are not competition to humans for food. And I'd really like to drive into that, but please continue your, your line okay. of thinking. <laughs> so, so on, and we'll come right back to that. On the yeah. global basis, if you look at all of the domesticated ruminants that somebody's managing somewhere in the world, it's been estimated that about 96% of all the feed that goes into all those animals is not human edible. It's grass, it's brush, it's browse, it's crop residue. It's in some cases, it might be grain that's not human edible for various reasons. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of byproduct material goes into feeding livestock. So these are things to, that, that many people aren't aware of. Um, back to this aspect, what the ruminant animals can do is improve the value of resources. So in, in most of what they eat is not human edible, but even what they do eat that is human edible, they take it and they make it better. Such yeah. that ruminant animals the, in the United States beef animals actually produce more human edible protein than they consume. And it's of a higher quality. So it's a double win. And some people talk about this as upcycling, yeah. which is a nice term. Um, we can get into protein because that's a whole nother thing. I've been <laughs> yes, it is. getting distracted. Let's talk about amino acid. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. Or not. <laughs> but well, okay. So, and that's whenever... Um, I'm watching like how it's made with the kids or, or some show about that, about food production and things like that. You'll always get to where you've got a bunch of leftover stuff like corn cobs or things like that, that humans can't eat, or th there's just byproducts of farming, of food production. And, and a lot of times on the show, they'll flat out say, which is sold for animal feed. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting so, to me. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. It's interesting to me that by using those byproducts as a source of food for ruminants, you're lowering the cost of feeding those animals because you have something that would end up, well, in the, in the landfill or well, maybe you're if lower, you're, you're lowering the cost of that food. Yeah. For humans too. Yeah. So, so it, it, in, in both sides. So for example, there's a big almond industry in California. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever seen an almond, there's a hole around it that gets broken off. They actually feed that to dairy cattle. Oh, really? So you, in that case, you can get milk from almonds, <laughs> but we're not, we're not talking about the plant juice, right? Have you seen that video? Oh, oh just, no. There's a cartoon, and every time okay. I see it, it disturbs me. I just um, – so, so that would be one. Um, up here in the Northwest, there's a big potato pro – there's a big potato industry, yeah. a lot of processing, a lot of waste. That goes into feed yards as an as a energy feed. 
Um, in Western Oregon, there's still something of a cannery industry. So farmers will produce sweet corn that okay. goes to the cannery. Obviously they're, you know, they're going to take the kernels off the cob and now you've got whatever else is left and that gets trucked over to dairy farms. It gets, uh, many farms use it and, and they ensile it and then they feed it out. Um, and that's just in, in places where there's a big orchard industry and they're making juice, you can have apple pumice, for example, be another one. So there's this, and, and this is the same thing that we've been doing for centuries. It's just it, what you do, it, right? It, it, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, so there's, there's a history of this. It's not a new thing. Um, but I think that there's, I mean, it's obvious that the, a lot of people don't have a connection to agriculture and, uh, you know, from my perspective, um, when I got back into this, or sorry, when I got into the whole therapeutic carbohydrate reduction yeah. sphere and started following it, I had been out of agriculture. I was working in a high tech firm and oh, had really? been for a number of years. Uh, and no, they didn't have an agronomic department, but, um, I started reading the stuff that people were saying it, uh, about grass fed. And I was like, Oh, of course I'm a forage agronomist. I've been about grazing management for a long time and it must, you know, and, and then I started reading the literature and I started trying to look at what they were saying the benefits were and lining that up against what people were saying they were achieving through just standard, you know, low carb, ketogenic, whatever you want to call it. But these were people that weren't saying it has to be XYZ label claim. It's go to the market, buy what you can afford, buy what's accessible and what's appropriate to your choices. Mm -hmm. And they were improving all these conditions that people were saying were the result of not eating grass fed. If you know what I mean, that the people were very focused on omega six and omega three. And they were saying that diabetes and heart disease and all these other conditions were the result of this imbalance in those omega fatty acids. Yeah. My point is I'm trained to look at things from the perspective of what's the limiting factor here. Um, it's and, time to talk it, about barrels. Let's do it. Okay. So <laughs> since we can't use graphics, <clears throat> um, imagine that you've got, I'll just sit here and wave my hands and hit the microphone. Again. Um, imagine that you've got a, a, a barrel that's a wooden barrel. It's got staves. Those staves are a different length, right? Those are the things so, on the sides. Exactly. The For those slats. of us who aren't Coopers, right? <laughs> Nicely done. Um, give him some Ruminati points later. Um, yes. So the, um, the volume of that barrel is going to be set by whatever the shortest stave is, right? Can't hold more water than the shortest stave will let. Okay. You can increase the length of all those other staves and you're not going to hold any more water. You can spend money you can maybe even make the situation worse. So in fertility, for example, soil fertility, for example, if you don't identify what's the limiting nutrient and you apply too much of another one, you can actually create mm -hmm. toxicities. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so it's really important to know what these interactions are. And okay, so that's called Liebig's barrel and it's the law of the minimum. And I apply it to human health and say, I'm firmly convinced that hyperinsulinemia, chronically elevated insulin is the short stave. Yeah. Now, how we get there, we can talk about, but that <laughs> itself. And I'm, f I'm obviously open to the idea that there's more possible, but I don't understand how you could say anything definitive about those other factors until you've addressed that limiting factor, mm -hmm. right? Because the, the noise from that alone is so great. You can't see anything else. 
you you may think that you're seeing. So one of the things that happens in diet, for example, is nobody just changes one thing, right? Yeah. We we get concerned, so we make some dietary changes. Maybe we even start exercising at the same time. If we were smoking, maybe we stop smoking. We do all these things, some of which we may even be aware of. At the end of the day, we're likely to credit whatever progress we've made on the thing that got us started in the first place, because that's what we're aware of. Don't change more than one variable. Sorry, that's my thing. Uh, well, one, well, one at a time. If you can do that, you know you're you're obviously a superior human being. I'm not capable of doing that, um, but I am convinced of from the evidence that others, you know. Professor Bickman, you know, Ted Naiman. Uh, yeah. if, if I start naming people, I'll leave people out. And it doesn't mean anything except that my brain's failing. So there, there's just a whole rich literature that points to how uh, hyperinsulinemia is the, what, what was it? The, the, the unifying theory of chronic illness, I think, was Croft's paper in, in 2015. Yeah. And you start looking at that list and you start going, oh, my God, we've been so convinced that all of these diseases were the result of so many different possible causes. Mm -hmm. And the idea that maybe there's only one and, and certainly it won't hurt anything to look at it, I think. The quote I got from uh, Ben Bickman was um, virtually every chronic illness is either caused or made worse by insulin resistance, chronically elevated insulin, hyperinsulinemia. So that's a good place to start. Yeah. Um, I'm also very concerned by anything that makes this elitist in any way. We, we have to get this mainstream. It has to be accessible to everyone, wherever they are. So and if all you can afford is ground beef. That hot you, dogs. Or hot dogs, <laughs> maybe a little bit of mustard if you like the plants. Spam, um, eggs, you know, the cheap eggs, eggs that you can mm -hmm. buy at, the at, you know, Lost Leader. Um, you, you know, all of that is good canned salmon, right? Canned tuna, what, whatever is appropriate. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really suspicious of the quality claims because yeah. every time i say well what do you mean by better quality and then we devolve into value judgments not objective evidence and you know okay. whatever you want to buy whatever you can afford is great and and if a producer can supply the market and make a profit so that they can sustain their business i'm all for it um where um a little reluctant to go is when you have people vilifying others for the management decisions that they make or you know the 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 obvious example that was given at one point was overhearing someone in a store telling someone else oh you have to buy all these supplements in order to do keto whatever and you know the person that they were talking to is i can't afford that hmm. and you don't need it no. Right? That, that that's that's so that's part of the thing that gets in the way of people adopting this and that's something i i want to definitely avoid if we can well and you have a quote that um you you tend to put in almost all of your presentations about we should limit the amount of unnecessary human mm -hmm. suffering Mm -hmm. that that as as human beings that should be the goal of everyone and everything we should do should have that in mind as well um and there's a lot of unnecessary suffering that goes on because a lot of times people will say you have to buy this particular brand you have to buy fancy beef that was grown in australia and was massaged by pandas at the moonlight and you that's really not necessary the the return on investment of just eating beef or yeah, eggs I, I i just yesterday spoke with a rancher she is third generation um 
and what sh- you know the, the point that we were trying to articulate there is that a lot of the things that people are now aware of as being desirable practices are things that many people have been doing for generations and mm-hmm. i mean literally generations the fact that we've only re- the fact that more people are only coming to be aware of those and that there's a new name that we can hang on that, right? We seem to always get distracted and fascinated by the bright, shiny new thing. Mm-hmm. And it, it, we really need to make sure that we're bringing along all that we know from the, from before. And then again, like I say, let's, let's acknowledge the work that people have been doing mm-hmm. and then feel better about, buying what's affordable, what's accessible, what's appropriate to us, right? All those things are really important. Um, You know, telling people to spend more than they can afford without better evidence to support it, I really want us to rethink that. Well, and as far as um, optimizing nutrients, um, managing the nutrition of animals, it's a science. I've heard you say that before. Whereas human oh, nutrition. Let, let, me, let me tell you this one. This one just happened. <laughs> Go ahead. This one just happened. <laughs> I just interviewed a gentleman, a yeah. uh, researcher. Um, they ran a study. Now, you can do things with animals you cannot do and should not do with human beings, right? Ethical issues, right? But he <laughs> ran this what? study where he had closely related pigs, all females. Okay. He can control them precisely in terms of what they eat and for how long. The, the study was they replicated the macronutrient composition that was estimated by the NHANES data of what we eat, the typical st- 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 <laughs> standard, standard American, American diet. diet. Okay. I want to reclaim that acronym. I want to change it to species appropriate diet, but that's another thing. So they, <laughs> they replicated the carbs, fat, and protein. And that was one treatment group. The other treatment group was they just removed the sugar calories, not all the carbohydrates, but just the sugar from the standard American diet, replaced it with ground beef. Okay. And this is, this is in pigs. This is in pigs, which which are are monogastric. Right. They're widely accepted as being a good model for human physiology, endocrinology. People are using them. Okay. And even 4-H students know how to fatten a pig, grow a pig. We know that, right? Wait one. Okay. Wait one. one. (laughs) Don't step on my line, dang it. Sorry, man. (laughs) The vet, the attending vet, in this feeding trial stopped it early because of the detrimental effect it was having on the pigs eating the standard american diet (laughs) what (laughs) are you serious dead serious yeah yeah that's that's crazy okay so basically that just a little bit (laughs) it's like the irb saying we cannot continue this experiment because it is unethical to treat the research subjects in this way. It's exactly feeding what them is. what people eat, according to and survey data and Haynes. Yes. That is nuts. That so that just um, <laughs> yeah. So again. Um, That'll be, uh, uh, um, I'm looking forward to having that interview release because again, yes, there are people who've been doing this work for a very, very long time. We tend to be siloed, right? We tend not to hear from each other. We tend not to read the same journals. I mean, this gentleman's a meat scientist, right? (laughs) Um, how many people know of such a thing outside of agriculture? Yeah, ruminants. Well, I've, I know seven. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ruminants. Yeah. Um, so, so there's all of that, and then um, I 
want people to understand and value their own health appropriately. Right. And, and I, I love the line from from Ken Berry that, you know, it's it's not your fault, but it is your problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, 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 we can no longer rely on the experts to fix us. We should never have done that in the first place. Long story. We were familiar with that. Our, our physicians many times only know what they were taught. Right. And, and uh, there's a lot of reasons behind all that. And Gary Fetke and I went into a bit of that recently. So we have to become better informed and better advocates for ourselves. Um, I, I, I think um, one um, um, Ted Etan in another interview said that he likes to think of this as the decade of data or sorry, data over dogma. Oh, okay. The, the, the decade of data over dogma. Well, I hope he's right. <laughs> I, I, I really hope he's right. And we have resources like continuous glucose monitors and all kinds of things. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful about all that, but we need to tell people that because there's a big message that's about to hit us. And we need to tell people that the key to sustainable health care is by eating appropriately and reversing metabolic illness. And we need to tell people that they can, in fact, reverse these metabolic illnesses. Many people still believe that they're chronic, progressive, incurable, whatever. Mm -hmm. We need to tell people that when they do that, they will lower their environmental impact. So, so that we can argue back against the people who are saying we need to stop animal agriculture because of the environmental impact. Well, right? we touched so, on that a little bit already about the, the leftover food, which is right. never, that's never brought into the conversation about sustainability of ag animal agriculture. Right. But let's talk more about that. Um, you, is that what your presentation was about? Was yeah, that's the that's another aspect? set here. So okay. let's just make sure one that we understand that all in the United States, nine, that's not you know nine point zero percent of all the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are from agriculture in total. That's okay. plant and animal combined. Okay. So anything that has to do with farming. That's... Farming and ranching, right. Okay. So transportation, power, you know, electricity, that's like 28% each. So okay. whatever you hear in the public, hmm, th these are the numbers. Of that 9% total for agriculture, 4% of the total, so less than half of yes. the agriculture is coming from animal agriculture less than and and a little less than half of that is coming from beef so beef is somewhere less than two percent of the total anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions in the united states and for people who don't want don't know what anthropogenic means it means done by humans right human produced right yeah. and so this is the these are the emissions that people are concerned about we could talk about that. I just want to focus on the actual numbers of the actual substance, right? So already plant agriculture produces more emissions than all of animal agriculture by a little bit. Yeah. Now to scale things, 10% of our total greenhouse, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions are credited to healthcare. Okay. Just, okay, let's leave that marker. Now let's take a look. If you were to double the average, you know, if, if, if a person were to double the average U.S. consumption of raw boneless trim beef per day, okay? So if somebody's saying, you know, I'm concerned about my beef consumption, I want to tell them, that if you're eating the average and you double it, that's less and that's life cycle emissions now. That's everything it takes to produce that boneless, right, 
trimmed beef, that's less than just the tailpipe emissions from driving 2,700 miles a year or one commercial flight from JFK to LA via Denver round trip. Okay. That's nuts. So go ahead. I just said that's nuts. <laughs> it, 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 there are times when I do wonder what we're even talking about because the numbers are such, right? Yeah. And, and, and we need to understand one, those last two, the driving in the air, that's just burning fuel. That's not what it took to make the airplane, what it took to make the concrete for the airport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And also, when we're talking about beef, we're talking about primarily a cycling of CO2 from the atmosphere into the plants via photosynthesis. The cow eats the plant. Some portion of that gets burped, not farted. It's burping. You're welcome. <laughs> gets burped out as methane. That methane has a lifetime of about 10 years in the atmosphere when it gets oxidized back to CO2 and the cycle starts over again. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about is a cycling of CO2 in the case of beef. And in the case of these others, you're burning fossil fuels. You're actually enriching the CO2 level. Okay. So there's that. Um, if anyone starts telling, you know, another confusion let's be charitable and say people are confused <laughs> um they'll use a global figure for livestock and put it on the united states so the global figure is pegged somewhere around 14.5 percent okay but they'll put all that on beef well but global beef is six percent of the global anthropogenic greenhouse gas mm. emissions and the U.S. beef production is less than a half a percent of the global total. Mm. Yet we've got 8% of the world's beef cattle. And that gets to our efficiency. And in efficiency, you have lower environmental impact. And so now these numbers are not accounting for the other environmental factors that, you know, we're talking about soil enriching and all that other stuff. This oh, is right. just... This is just emissions. This is ignoring this is the rest could, of the of the conversation entirely. Yeah, we could we could talk about water, we could talk about other things. This is just looking at the emissions things because I think it's enough for us to start at least the process of then re-examining all these other arguments. Yeah. Um, you know, there's there's a graph here that shows methane emissions uh, what we call cattle enteric methane okay uh enteric is just a fancy name for what takes place in the rumen yeah. um in the united states those emissions have essentially been flat since 1961 in europe they've been trending downwards since probably the 70s oh wow uh, where they're increasing is in the developing world, where people need animal source food production. All right. So just we need to make sure that we understand the differences between global and any one country's numbers. And we need to understand the trends that are taking place. Um, there's a lot of things in what's happening in, in the low and middle income countries. And I could talk about some of that. Um but people have done studies. There was a paper released in 2017 where they tried to model um, the nutritional and greenhouse gas impacts of removing animals from U.S. agriculture. Just taking and it out entirely. Taking like, them out entirely. And, and, and by the way, they don't get to hang around, right? There's no retirement home here. So <laughs> um, after the world's largest barbecue, what they predict is potential benefits, potential costs. The potential benefit from removing all animal agriculture from agriculture, as well as all pets, right? Because they don't talk much about that, but that's a big thing too. That's a, that's um, a big thing. <laughs> yeah. So, so the potential benefit is you would reduce anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions by 
0.6% in the US, which would be less than four tenths of a percent of the global budget. Okay. And that's, the potential- that's not a good return on investment. It's not nothing, but yeah. really. Um, and the potential costs are that you would unbalance your food ecosystem and you'd create essential dietary nutrient deficiencies. That yeah. might be a problem. Okay, so, so we've got that as background. But then I went and said, what's the footprint of diabetes? Okay. And, and many people, so many of the conversations that I've listened to, read, participated in, stop talking about sustainability of food when it gets to the retail, right? They don't take it through to the health of the consumer. And I want to do that. Yeah. And so the average American with type 2 diabetes uses pharmaceuticals equal to two metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year. This is just pharmaceuticals. Okay. Oh, wow. Now okay. let's just, let's just imagine, I know I'm, I'm wildly speculating here, but just hypothetically imagine there were some way that a type two diabetic could get off their diabetes medications. We're not talking about getting rid of them from people that need them, right? It, just hypothetically speaking. Yeah, hypothetically, I, I'm not sure. Have, have we heard of anything that would do that? I'm not sure. Maybe we could come back to that. But if you okay. could do that, it would result in the reduction of almost 50 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent per year in the United States alone. Well, that sounds like a big number. It is. What's it mean? Well, that would be the carbon sequestered by more than 65 million acres of forests in one year. So that would be an area of forest that would be the ninth largest state in the United States between Colorado and Oregon. What it would, would we be call the, it though? Like Wyoming or the, something? It would be the 76th largest country in land area. It would be larger than the United Kingdom. Okay. Wow. It's roughly equivalent to 275,000 rail cars of coal. Now, if you were to make a train that long, that would be 2,700 miles, essentially, which is essentially the distance from Philadelphia to Los Angeles. Ooh. Uh, okay, how about automobiles? It's the equivalent to the emissions from more than 10.8 million passenger cars driven for one year. That's 4% of the registered passenger vehicles in the United States. It's, a, it's more than 5.7 million homes energy use for one year. And we're just talking about the reduction in like the greenhouse gas emissions from the manufacturing of their, of their the pharmaceuticals. pharmaceuticals. We're not the talking pharmaceutical about all of the rest that no, would go along exactly. with that. Okay. Exactly. It's equivalent to the emissions avoided by replacing 1.9 billion incandescent bulbs with LEDs. <laughs> okay, last one, last one. It's the emissions avoided by almost 10,800 wind turbines running for a year. And I've got a wonderful picture of a wind turbine in the background and cows in the foreground. And I wanna say, what's the truly renewable en uh, industry here? Yeah. So, Again, when you improve your health, you are improving the world. And here's just one way. We have yet to talk about testing supplies, right? There's a lot of plastics there. Yeah. What's the impact of that? Um, how about the travel to the doctor and back? And this is, I'll put air quotes around just, this is just diabetes, what about the heart disease, the fatty liver, the Alzheimer's disease, the kidney disease, the all of those, somebody described it this way, and I have to make the graphic, you know, diabetes is like the sixth leading cause of death or something in the United States. But if you look at the ones, the five above it, how much of those are really diabetes? Well, if you listen to Dr. Ben Bickman, and I do, <laughs> they're probably related to the same thing. So, so this has the potential to be a huge impact environmentally in terms of the, the sustainable, 
stability, the, 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 the sustainability of our healthcare system on a number of levels. And it has, I think if we could explore this a bit more, we might find that the whole conversation just shifts because my experience is it, it tends to be like a game of whack-a-mole, right? Okay. We're going to, you know, we're going to pop up yeah. with this issue. And then when you address that with scientific evidence, okay, now this one pops up mm -hmm. and it's still the same people. I mean, they, they, they shift better than a race car driver. I mean, they just change in the way they go and as if nothing ever happened yeah right the, the, they're really quite remarkable some of the interests that are op opposing animal agriculture in general and ruminant animal agriculture in particular yeah well and it's uh, and something that we talked about earlier that i i kind of want to get back to is you know you were you were talking about your tribes and how about the whole grass-fed thing now i'm a technology guy um, when I see someone talking about technology, about, uh, there's this TV show that we really like to watch as a family called Scorpion and the, the technology facts that they have on that are so atrociously mm -hmm. false. Mm. It's hilarious in and of itself, but I can't take them seriously with a lot of the stuff they say, because I mean, they're just talking about just stupid stuff and throwing things out there. And I'm kind of worried that if we're talking about, and I've heard you say this before, if we're talking about agriculture and about grass-fed beef and about um, the environmental impact of cows and someone who works in that field hears us talking about that and they're going to look at us and go, well, that's not right. Mm -hmm. What are you even talking about? That has no nothing to do with anything. Like, that's not even like uh, remote credibility is really important and and um like i say i i have maintained the the name grass-based health in part to remind me of of where i was and where i no longer am as far as that belief i think it's yeah. also justified because as i've explained ruminant animal agriculture is grass-based right yeah. regardless of how the animals are finished <laughs> um, but no, I think that that is a, a, a concern that I urge people to um, be aware of. Um, and, you know, it, it would be and it's it's a concern that I need to have when I talk about things to do with medical issues. Right. Because I'm not that kind of doctor. Um, <laughs> but but I think that we can bring the audiences together um, and yeah, the, the people that I have worked with for several decades need to hear the health message um, for their own personal health, the health of their families. Um, also, I think their industries need to hear it so that they can shift and adapt and, and onboard it because I think they've got a wonderful good message if they can figure out how to do that. And there's a lot of things, you know, I don't mean to minimize it. There's, there's a lot of um, aspects to that story. Um, but clearly we've got this, this problem that we have to address. And I want to, as much as I can, pull some of the roadblocks off the path so that we can make better progress. Well, and I, one of the things I really like about your message is a lot of people I've, I've heard, I've seen them on Reddit in the keto subreddit. I've seen them in different keto Facebook groups. Um, they are absolutely happy with the success and the progress that they're making in their own health journey, but they're worried about like the environmental impact of eating all this meat. And because they're listening to the narrative of these people who have also told them that the best thing that they can eat is a plant only diet. Mm -hmm. Let me be f clear with the based because I bristle every time someone says plant based because I'm like, do you mean 50% greater than 50% protein? Are we talking about calories? What do you mean by based? Anyway, mm -hmm. um, they, you know, they hear these, these people who say, you know, you should stop eating all of these, these animals, or you should switch to, 
okay, if you're gonna do keto, maybe you should do vegetarian keto because that's really sustainable. And that's a good way to get your protein. Yeah. So, so I, I'm, I'm really weary of us and them. Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm losing any interest in that. What I hope we can do is find a way to, conf to, to convey the highest quality evidence that we have and also admit what we don't know. You know, um, and and just be open about that so that people can make the best decisions that they can. If somebody wants to be a carnivore, great. If somebody wants to be an omnivore, which is the word that I would use instead of vegetarian, great. If you want to be a vegan, as long as you're not trying to produce or raise a, a, a young human being, Right. I guess you can do whatever you want. Um, I am concerned about children because you have the potential to do something that will last for the lifetime of that child in terms of harm. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to do that last option, you really need to know some things that you probably don't fully appreciate. Um, so again, a recent interview and I haven't checked it out. So this may or may not be true. I hope it is true because otherwise, um, but he said that if you go to the Wikipedia page and you talk about protein quality, they will tell you that quinoa is a complete protein. And in the small print, what they say is that all the essential amino acids are present present so not, there's a measurable that, detectable amount not and not that they're utilizable not that they're digestible by a human being and not that they're there in the proper amount but that they're present they also label beef an incomplete protein right and so so you have this information that's out in that community that would mislead somebody mm -hmm. into thinking that they're doing what they need to and, and then, of course, we could talk about how if you look on a food label and it says protein, that isn't actually protein. That's a whole nother story. Yeah. We could talk about how tables are made up of average values. And when you talk about plant source foods, they're much more variable than animal source foods in terms of their nutritional quality. And what's on a label, what's in a table is an average value. Well, if that average sits between these two extremes, what the hell are you eating? And you have no idea. And this is understood in animal nutrition. It's also probably understood in human nutrition, too. We just don't talk about it much, right? So there are all these aspects. I just want people to have the information. And if they want to talk about environmental impact, then we have information to suggest. The, and, you know, I think Sacred Cow does a good job of showing people some things that they may not be aware of. Uh, I think there's a couple of these things in the pipeline that hopefully will help. Uh, there's lots of research. Here's one for you. If you're going to eat grass-fed beef because you think it has lower emissions than the feedlot, you're exactly wrong. Really? You're precisely wrong. Okay, hold on. Let's unpack that because that's a bold statement. Well, if you understand, so, so the methane generation is a function of the fiber content in the diet. Okay. And when you go into a feedlot, you're feeding more of what we used to call concentrate feeds and less of the roughage feeds. These are old terms, but so less of the hay and silage, which would be high fiber and more of the low fiber, higher digestible, higher energy feeds. When you okay. do that, their methane emissions go down. There's also some management practices that are in place. Methane is a represents, in one way of looking at it, as an inefficiency, right? It's, yeah. it's a loss of food energy, right? It's, okay. it's, it's reduced carbon that isn't available for the animal. And before so, we jump out of that really quick, something that you talked about in the interview with Dr. Schur is about antibiotics. Mm-hmm. A lot of people think when they hear that cows do or do not have antibiotics, we're talking about giving them antibiotics to stop an infection or stop a disease or things like that. What is really meant by 
when you give a cow antibiotics? Well, for a, a, a period of two years now, I think, you, there is no longer the routine use of antibiotics in feed as a growth promoter. Okay. So you need, you need veterinary prescriptions and you need that sort of thing. So there, there is a class of antibiotic. They're called ionophores. They have absolutely no use or application in human medicine. Those are still used. So that's a little different. You need to make sure when people talk about antibiotics, what exactly are you talking about? There's been a real effort to separate those antibiotics that are important in human medicine from those in animal agriculture. Um, people talk about how much is used and, you know, it only makes sense if you've got a 1200 pound animal, it's going to take more to treat than a 120 pound woman. I mean, it, it, <laughs> so these, these little nuances get, get missed sometimes. Um, but in general, and as the rancher I just interviewed said, they're expensive, right? They're expensive to purchase. They're expensive to administer. It's a hassle to handle these large animals and get them in a chute and, and hit them with a, so it's, it is a, a, a treatment of last resort. And there's a lot of effort within the industry to say, what, what can we do to lessen the need for these, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't make up for bad nutrition with antibiotics. I know radical concept. Yeah, well, there you um, go. But but you know, and 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 think about if you've got animals running on pasture, it's not like you can walk up to the cow and hold three tablets out in your hand and she's going to slurp them up, right? <laughs> so so all of those things. Cow. Yeah. So the, all of these things, in fact, sometimes uh, people get, it's an issue when you go out into, you know, the calving pasture and you want to, you know, like weigh or dip navels or put an ear tag in or anything like that. Mama may not like you doing that. Yeah. So, so one of the things people actually select for in their herd is good mother instinct without being psychopathic about it. Um, but, but again, yeah. these are just some, these are just some little realities in that day-to-day -day world of raising beef animals in this case, but yeah. you could look at other large animal practices. I mean, it's, there is a danger that, that, you know, you're out in the environment, right? So yeah. if there's a blizzard, and the cows still need to be fed, guess what happens? You still feed the cows. <laughs> you still have to feed the cows. Um, a, a family <laughs> physician from Montana gave me the story about cows come first. Oh. Right, that, that one of his patients, um, um, he got a call from like the emergency department or whatever saying, could you talk some sense into your patient? And he came in and this is a guy he, you know, he treated for decades and family and whatever. And he'd had a heart attack and he was refusing admission. <laughs> and okay. he said, doc, I'll, I'll sign whatever you want. You know, I'll be back tomorrow, but I got to go home and take care of the cows. I'll make arrangements for somebody to take care of them tomorrow. But tonight yeah, I got to take, you know, cows come first. Right. And, and so that is a reality for people who are doing this. And then to have people say, you know, that they're exploiting their animals, that they're abusing their animals, that, mm -hmm. you know, a third generation on the land would be somehow degrading that land. I mean, some of these things kind of go against just Logic? intuitive sense once you get the other pieces put together. Yeah. Well, don't they also use some forms of antibiotics to reduce the methane emissions of their burps? There, there is that effect from the use of the ionophores that I mentioned. Okay. And now if, if a cow was, um, you know, like antibiotic free, does that mean they can't use those ionophores? Well, if you've got animals that are, you know, some kind of label claim, then these things do become a wow. restriction on what you can do. And so, yeah, then, then you have this, well, first of all, people consider organic to be synonymous with natural, right? 
And See, to or- me, organic means it has carbon. So what well, are we talking or- about here? <laughs> well, organic means it was produced using pesticides that are approved for use in organic agriculture. Yes. Doesn't mean they're less toxic. Doesn't mean, it, right? I mean, that's just, I'm, I'm not saying anything more than that. Yeah. Um, and so in this other case, you have this reality where certain practices that would be looked on favorably within the marketplace actually end up having a negative environmental effect compared to some other, you know, management practice that doesn't get looked on favorably. Yeah. Well, to come back to what you were talking about for third generation farmers and stuff, I know of no one who is more interested in the health of their animals, Mm -hmm. of their soil, of maintaining the water Mm -hmm. and all of that sort of stuff than a farmer whose family has been farming that land for forever. Yeah. I mean, it, it, to be fair, occasionally we hear about problems and oftentimes there's some kind of tragedy behind all that of of some kind you know and also at we're learning all the time right so some people have been doing things just because they thought it was the right Mm -hmm. thing to do and now a couple decades later hey a scientist comes along and says you know that's the right thing to do um in other cases you know, people did the best they knew how to do. And now in hindsight, we can see it really wasn't that good a thing to do. There's a lot of reasons they did it. It's not to judge them. It's just to say that today we know better and hopefully we can change and improve. And yeah, there's lots of room for improvement. Um, What's ironic is we have I got in trouble for making fun of her, so I won't do it anymore. We have some people saying we only have 12 years, right, before global warming takes us out or whatever. And it's important for people to understand even the IPCC report doesn't say that. If, If you go into the actual chapters that are written by the actual scientists that are doing the work, it doesn't say that. Where it says that is in the summary for policymakers, right? The executive summary, which oh. isn't written by the authors, right? It's written with a whole nother purpose in mind. Yeah. Even the 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 worst case for from the scientist's perspective puts the negative effects like out to the latter half of this century. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, we have people from the Food and Agriculture Organization saying, and this was a couple of years ago, we only have 60 harvests left because of the soil loss oh. and degradation. So there are people who are saying that if we change this management, we'll reverse climate change. I wish they would stop saying that. It's, it's just you look at the numbers, it won't work. Um, one study I came across, and maybe this has now been superseded and I haven't found something better, but basically what they were saying is if we could r- improve management on all the degraded soil. So one of the things we have to understand is soil holds a certain amount of organic matter based on the environment, based on a lot okay. of factors, right? Yeah. There's an equilibrium once the soil is just all happy. If we could get all the soil in the world happy, all the degraded soils happy, we'd be talking about 12% of the global greenhouse gas emission, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions sequestered per year for 50 years. Oh, wow. Okay. At the end of 50 years, the soil's all happy. We've achieved a new equilibrium. And now what? Right. Meanwhile, Hopefully what we could focus on more is what can we do to conserve our soils, which will end up increasing organic matter, but not to reverse climate change, but to preserve the soil, which all life depends on, right? We have to have soil in order to grow feed or food, um, in order to grow animals or plant source food that we're going to eat. And without that soil, then it all falls apart like many ancient civilizations have fallen apart because they degraded their resources. So this is a much shorter time frame than even the climate change, which has everyone's attention. So, Mm -hmm. and again, one of the keys to soil health is having the soil covered all the time with, with growing plants on it, in it, and have grazing animals on those plants. 
Because you have to those, either burn it or have it eaten, right? Well, that's that's to maintain the health of the, the grasslands, but obviously yeah. f it would be far more desirable to have the plant animals eat it than burn yeah. it. Eat um, it and poop it and step on the poop and break up the soil and push yeah, the stuff in. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the treading thing is another thing I hear a lot of people talking about, and there's probably something there, but there's, okay. also, the, there's also the danger of soil compaction okay. if, under the proper conditions, and then that becomes a problem. So, you know, maybe we're not ever talking about getting completely rid of tillage, but maybe we could minimize tillage. You know, so instead of every year, we do it every 10 years, for example, or something along that line. So, yeah, again, this is one of those things that I hear a lot and I kind of go, mm, well, maybe we want to <laughs> just kind of rethink that just a little bit. So I, I have a feeling that Miriam could sit here not saying anything and we could just go on and on for mm -hmm, like hours probably. and hours and hours. I practice my smile. <laughs> but... Um, if people are interested in hearing more from, well, we, we like to call Dr. Ballers the, the sod father. Yes. Uh, because, you know, grass, sod, you know. Well, all see, that. there was this, there was this thing called the Ruminati. Yes. And, and the Ruminati <laughs> is a growing, hopefully, group of people who understand some portion of this space from production through consumption. Yeah. of ruminant animal agriculture and ruminant animal products and human health. And my goal is to have that group educate each other and then educate more people. Yeah. So that was the Ruminati that grew out of this group of people. And then because it was the Ruminati, I became the sod father. And yep. then somebody else gave me the title of Don Pedro, the sod father. <laughs> Don Pedro. So that's, that's how all that developed. And then, yeah, I did start a podcast, and I was talking about that for a while, and somebody said, you should call it a sodcast. And I was like, <laughs> how did I not think of that? Um, so, oh, so, you were yeah. here before to hear. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah, we now have the Meet Your Herdmates sodcast. And okay. um, that's and on YouTube. -E -T? No, no, not, I didn't do that. No, are you we're talking serious? about people. We're not talking about long pig here. We're talking about people. Um, uh, you understand the reference? Long yeah, pig? No. Look it up. Uh, look is it that, up. That's a, is, that's a bonus for you. Um, okay. So is that an animal you farm reference? I don't on, think it is. No, 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 okay. it's not. Um, <laughs> YouTube, uh, you can find the Meet Your Herd Mates. Um, and then on Podbean or any of the other uh, podcasting apps, if you look for the Herdmate Sodcast, you'll find the audio versions of the interviews. I've talked to now Adele Height, uh, Frederick Leroy, um, Brett Schur, Vinny Totorich, Danny Vega. Um, you just had Dave, Dave Feldman. Feldman. Yep. Nice. Yep. Um, and I've already recorded with Mike Eads, um, with Jay Wartman, um, Amy Berger's coming up. Oh, nice. Um, uh, already recorded. Um, like I say, I talked to Danny Beer, a, a rancher out of South Dakota. I talked to um, Eric Berg, the Eric Berg, not that other guy that you see all over the oh. place, but this is Eric P. Berg. He's the meat scientist from North ah, Dakota State. Um, <laughs> Does he get I, that a lot, by the way? Oh, um, <laughs> so we've we've got a bunch of um, there's there's a number of others already agreed in in the schedule um, for the rest of this month in January. And we're trying to release, we, I'm trying to release an episode uh, on Tuesday and Thursdays. Oh, wow. At, oh, that's at 2 p.m. Pacific. So, and then in addition, um, producing little short bits. Okay. Um, so like five to 10 minute segments on a particular topic. I'm still tr struggling with all the technology. I'm just yeah. faking this for the most part. And so far, so good, but occasionally things go wrong. So, um, yeah. Now, you can, can, people, find me. can people find links to that on your your uh, blog spot? 
Um, they shortly will. They okay. can also find if you're on Twitter, I've been posting. If you're on Facebook, um, I have a page called Grass Based Health, which is public. There's a group called the Ruminati, which is private and moderated. Okay. Um, I also publish them to my own page so you can find them there. Um, and if people, if you guys haven't followed Dr. Ballerstead on Instagram, people send him things. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do. <laughs> I'm very grateful. Some of which I actually publish. <laughs> and if you need, if you need, you need a, a pick me up, you need day. a laugh. You just find his Instagram. A lot of them are dad jokes. A lot of them are agriculture and cows. And they're just they're great. fantastic. We actually pulled it up this morning on our live stream. <laughs> <laughs> the picture of the Oscar Mayer truck driving across, <laughs> across the bridge. The bridge. <laughs> And then somebody wrote, that's, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, okay, so that, that's where people should go to hear more from you. You actually, um, and you've had a lot of presentations at different low-carb conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, we had you at uh, Keto Salt Lake. You mm -hmm. were supposed to come back for the Keto Salt Lake this year, but as everybody knows, well, we, yeah. we just, we, we quit this year. It's... We're done yeah. with 2020. It's it's over. Yeah, <laughs> so done. So done. Um, in fact, on my blog spot, which is called Grass Based Health, um, the last post it's just, that I it's just put right up, down there um, was a large list of all of the you know podcasts and presentations that I could think of, or maybe they were just interviews and present and podcasts. Whoops, now that I think of that, whoops. Um, but I do think I put together some presentations. In any case, if you search on YouTube, some are on Vimeo, but most of them are on YouTube. Look for Ballerstead. There's not that many of us. Yeah, you get the spelling of Ballerstead right, you're mm -hmm. going to find it. And you'll find presentations with Dr. Ballerstead talking about what protein really is. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And every time somebody talks about you know plant-based foods, and protein i just i just kind of rub my forehead and go okay mm -hmm. uh, yeah okay <laughs> so yep. Miriam, is there anything you wanted to talk about to peter about nah okay. i just want to give him a high <laughs> <Aww>. fist bump <laughs> yeah elbow all that stuff that's right yeah well yeah. thank you so much for your time peter we meant to have you on earlier and it I just totally spaced it, and then 2020 happened. And yeah, yeah. It's you're March too... still. It just keeps on coming. <laughs> oh, jeez! <laughs> you know, what a decade we've had this year. Yeah. Um, oh, I just I just booked my first trip since the beginning of February. Oh, really? Where are you going to go? Savannah, Georgia, oh, wow. in the beginning of January. So. Okay. Uh, we have one question. Renee keeps on asking this over and over again. She wants to know why they call it cow farts even in sacred cow, if it's actually burps? Um, well, I guess because it's funny. I mean, you know, I love a good fart joke as much as anybody, but um, it, yeah, it, that's just the, the quality of the conversation is that people are talking about farts when in fact it's belches. Yeah. Now, there, there is some methane that comes off of manure handling, yes. right? So that, that's a different situation, but as I said earlier, when it came to feed resources, the vast majority of cow poop is going to end up on the pasture, yeah. right? So we're not talking about the, the storage of it, and therefore those issues are not present. It's, it's from the belching, not the farting. Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> on, on that, that note. note... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I well, love science. You. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Peter. And don't forget, next time you're in Salt Lake, whenever I'll that eat happens, I'll a steak again, with you anytime. I'm going to make sure okay. that I'm going to eat a steak too. So, nice. <laughs> all right. Well, you have a fantastic night, and we'll catch you next time we see you. Thank you. Look forward to it. Good health to everyone.